Hi, good morning, Hyderabad. Hi, what a great time, uh, I would say, what a great setting. I don't know if it was planned. Uh, we had two sessions before. My name is Gurpreet Bajaj, I'm from Nolscape. Uh, of course, you see the topic behind me, but uh, what I was more uh, excited about while I was waiting there is, what a great way to set it up. The first session spoke about the differences between possible differences, which we are still debating between different Gen X, Y, Z. How do we manage them? Do they even exist? And the second one, openly bringing up very, very interesting topic of what's the role of technology, where it finishes, and where it starts, right? And I think it's, there can't be a better time for me possibly to uh, ask for to start what uh, my topic is today, which is leadership development for the modern employee. Uh, also, I think it's very interesting as a topic because uh, I possibly can bring two perspectives uh, when I kind of thought of this topic. One as a ex LD head, I've spent about good about close to two decades uh, leading learning and development, so very, very closely can understand the battles which I personally have gone through uh, with all the Gen X, Y, Z, A, B coming all the way through that. Uh, and now I work with you know a new age talent transformation company called Nolscape where I'm on the other side and I'm actually now prescribing and working with companies in terms of building future solutions for the new age. So hopefully I'll be able to uh, share some insights in the next about 15 minutes and would love to hear uh, what you all have to say as well. Uh, but before that, I think, just want to comment on the first, especially, which we spoke about different uh, generations, because that's kind of a little linked, because you, what you don't see here is what I'm more comfortable saying is modern employee, rather than a Gen X and Gen Y there, because it reminds me of uh, George Orwell, one of the English authors, who once said, very interesting, he said about this whole debate of generations, and he said that, it's always true that every generation thinks that it is more intelligent than the one before it and more wiser than the one who will come later. Isn't that true? I always thought we all had more gray cells, a bit more than our parents. And uh, we also think now when we see the next generation that they are a bit more reckless than us. But interestingly, my mom never thought any different. And I'm sure that trend is going to continue. So I'm more comfortable with saying modern employee rather than I would say Gen X and Y, which I'll open it up for debate there. Uh, before we start, it's important for us to possibly go in a bit of a time machine because for us to say what is modern, we also probably need to know what is old, right? So there's a, there's a component of time possibly which is worth exploring. So let me take you all to a bit of time machine. I promise to bring you all back. Uh, but let's start from the present. This is what 2017 looks like. Everybody okay with this? Okay, let's go back, uh, 10 years back at least. Let's go back 2007. This is what 2007 looked like. Well, not a surprise, I don't have much things to show here. Any guesses why? None of these existed 10 years back, which is so much a part of our life, we almost thought it's, it's the way to go, it is the way it is. None of them existed 10 years back. And reminds me of Gordon Moore, Intel founder, couldn't have been more relevant when he talks about change has never happened this fast before and will never be this slow again. But what this has to do with leadership development again, and stay on with the theme, we are still on the time machine, Let's go back, and maybe I suggest you to go back in time as well. I thought about this when I was talking about what is modern and what is old. What is really changing, if it is? So I took a, uh, like a trip back in my childhood. Uh, way back when I was a kid, the consumption channels of the way I used to consume things, or even if I saw my family used to consume things, versus how they are today. Now, think about news, think about food, think about careers, Think about networks, relationships, add the list. Add as much activity as possible. Think about travel. Everything which we used to consume, I'm sure you can echo with this. There is something which has changed, and all of us are modern learners. There is no Gen X, Y here. The larger difference is how we have started consuming things differently. I pegged on it more, and I realized that Welcome to the experience economy. What probably is changing is not really the generational shifts, we all are a part of it, is the way we have been now used to consume things around us, which also includes workplace learning, 
to other objectives as well. So look at that, when you look at it from an agrarian economy to an industrial to a service, and now an experience economy, as they say. So there is no doubt why a Starbucks cup sells at about $5 a cup, when essentially the coffee beans are like even a fraction of it. This is what probably tells of how experience economy has taken course. Now, if this has happened in the world, and you can have different examples, again, think of transport, hotels. We used to kind of think of just a place to live. We are going on a holiday, and now it's an overall experience, not just in the hotel, but the way we book the hotel, the way we look at the reviews, and everything around it. Now, if we realize that we are in the experience economy, or this is what largely the change might be, rather than the generational part necessarily, the good or the bad news uh, so far as we take it is so has the model learner. And if you kind of map this back and I try to do this in a way is that we've also realized that the modern learner, which includes again all of us today, the way we are consuming things around, have also moved in terms of their expectations of moving from commodities, goods, services to experiences there. And that's my premise of this talk there, that what is really changing of that there. So, Experience being the king rather than the content or the commodity is the new change which we see. Uh, we start with basic educations which were essentially largely commoditized. That was a basic minimum entry for you and that probably was your best learning experience. Okay, what probably is now they're not satisfied. Then you have executive educations, MDPs, LMS, content libraries, MOOCs as we spoke about, executive coaching. These are the service oriented response to the experience economy, whether as far as learning is concerned. The next level is experiences, which we talk about. Right here we talk about gamified business simulation, use of AR, VI, or VR or AI, wherever required, and omni-channel leadership journeys, not just online, not just mobile, not just classroom, but a mix of the overall ecosystem play in terms of that. There is nothing too different. The key part which I realized was that experiences don't have any boundaries or the need for experiences doesn't have any boundary. If I'm, if, I'm, if I'm a modern learner, if I'm ordering my food in a way, if I'm ordering my travel in a way, and I walk into the company, and here is a learning department who prescribes me something, how can I change my way of you know, experiencing? The fact that you're all here, you've come with no big hat outside. Maybe somebody booked an Ola, an Uber, right? We all are already used to that experience and we come here with reasonable expectations. Not just to get the content, but also to get an experience of it. So there is no change, except that experience as a need is omnipresent. And that also includes the learner in front of me. Who's the learner? Who's the modern employee there? Again. Uh, Person by Deloitte Research, again, stay away from X or Y here, but essentially see what the modern learner is, which includes all of us. And you'll probably relate uh, when we see what the person for Deloitte found about this one. Uh, first, distracted. 66% complain that they don't have time to do their jobs. Distracted, generally. 41% of the time, they offer little personal satisfaction and they don't help to get the work done, which we've also heard before. Number two, impatient. 27 number of times on an average, a modern learner includes all of us, again, uh, usually goes online each day. And even in meetings like this, or the most important meeting you do, the numbers don't really change. On an average, it's still saying whether meeting or no meeting, we still try to unlock our smartphones at least nine times, right? Uh, so this is an impatience as a characteristic, which is amongst all of us there. Finally, overwhelmed. Imagine the amount of data, the options which are available there, and the distractions, whether it's digital, whether it's people, whether it's the work speed there. Average, just about five minutes of an average interval at which a worker gets interrupted in one way or the other. Now that's a whole premise, I would say, uh, of a modern employee or a learner there, okay? Uh, so what's a big problem statement from a leadership development point when we think of this possible modern learner might just be one of us facing the same challenges. The big question is, how do we develop leaders out of such a modern employee, very talented, but with very different needs and priorities across stakeholders? Now, this is a very interesting uh, slide, I would say, because this kind of brings out the real problems and battles of L&D in today's world, especially with the context which we started off with. Business, uh, what is changing? What is the business demand from, from L&D? 
business themselves are changing. As we realize, the outcomes of talent are essentially dependent on the success of the business itself. Now, what is business going through? Unimaginable amount of disruption, whether it's business models, whether it's the territories, whether it's the competition. Banks are becoming phone companies. Phone companies are thinking of becoming banks. Your taxi guys are delivering food. They're thinking of new mediums there. You ask any CEO of a business plan of it, nobody talks beyond 18 months. Earlier, which used to be five years and 10 years there, because everything is volatile on that. Okay, now with that, the expectation from leadership pipeline from L&D is not like, okay, I'll give you five years, I'll give you some good leaders here, or let me make a five-year leadership plan for you. The need is to churn out accelerated, agile leaders who can take up maybe some businesses which we don't even are in right now. Okay, full alignment with business goals, meaning taking precedence over just numbers of training days. If effective engagement, purely coming from that, the business realizes that if you can't engage the guys, given the profile at the back, it's gonna be failing. Uh, hard to put people in a classroom and make them run the show. Uh, ensure scale and cost effectiveness. Money is not coming free, margins are reducing, businesses are facing extreme competition from all sorts of players there. So the scale is important as you scale up, but also at a cost. So you're getting questioned everywhere on the ROI, on the scaling, on the relevance, on you know the productivity of every single dollar invested. Okay. Add to this is the learner change, which we spoke about. High comfort with technology and mobile. To be honest, that's the ecosystem we work with there. Value experience over instruction naturally. Remember, they are the experience economy natives of that. Uh, now, this kind of senses a bit of tug of war. Don't you see this? At one side, there's a learner who's constantly demanding, give me something which is technology enabled, on time, on demand, on use. The business on the other side said, well, do all that if that keeps the person engaged, but make sure it gives me actual leaders. It just doesn't make a good experience only. Okay, so what is the pressure for the L&D? What's the battle? I have faced this throughout my career as well, but there's no other time it's got more accentuated at this time because of the forces on both sides. Pressure to meet business objective, manage expectations from both sides, content and solution explosion. 10 years back, imagine how much options did we have when we did a Google search on, let's say, an online content or training providers, which are kind of a little next stage. There are plenty of options, plenty of content there, right? You see MOOCs and you suddenly wonder, why should ever somebody come to my company? Everything is available. What do I do as L&D when there are so many MOOCs there? Am I still required? If there are 20,000 courses lying for everything possible which is on my L&D agenda, what do I do? How do I make choices? How do I sit on so much data and then take decisions? Who needs investment? How somebody has taken a course? Why somebody has not completed? Which one is more relevant? How do I promote somebody? Are there any more data points rather than just 360 feedback? Is there any other data which I'm missing on? The design response to this problem, since we are here to talk about possible solutions, uh, and this kind of also gives a bit of response on how Nullscape works, uh, as we have worked with 250 plus clients there. The answer lies, uh, is not in one straight answer, is eventually a multi-pronged approach to do the desired objectives. Now, if the outcome is what you see here, which is not too different for all businesses at this time there, how do we get it is a big question for L&D. There are three elements to it, which we see. The strategy needs to back up with the necessary capability. And importantly, as somebody spoke, culture. And that is where I see a hope, and a big hope for HR and l and I've been a part of a lot of conferences. To be honest, I would say blank watch. Even if I miss a conference, I can possibly predict 80% of the talk would be around how HR gets a space on the table, how we partner with the business, how business watches us and say we exist. Isn't that true, right? But I don't think there's ever a better time for HR and L&D to be in the business as they are right now with the kind of disruption the business is going on. The strategy is there, okay? Most of the, let's say, companies do have strategy. They sometimes even have the technology to do it. When we work with companies for digital transformation projects there, that is one single big question is that, you know what, I need my HR more than ever before. 
I know I was like a bit neglected before and I was focusing more on profits, margins, and I always used to say what HR is doing, more administrative, but you know what? We are gonna change our business models altogether. We're gonna be grappling technology. We're gonna get all that. How do we get people and how do we get people to change the mindset to work differently? HR is in business. And if you see this equation, two of the variables sit right inside our pocket, which is capability building and culture building there. I push forward to say how this happens. It happens, we all agree with this, but any answers to how do we get this there? Yes, and how do we possibly work at Nolscape to bring learning and business outcomes together? My first response to strategy, now how do you build strategy? We heard of things called business acumen. Usually we think of that as a competency to work on there, but let me kind of give you a bit of fresh perspective on how can you build that one? How do you build a strategic acumen? Some examples. Uh, Instead of, I would say, thinking traditional, okay, maybe shadow with the CEO or maybe do a bit of two-day course somewhere and kind of come back, what we really do with companies here as a quick use case is we put what we call is a business modeling tool. This is an online tool, okay? Uh, not very difficult to deploy at all there. We work with the businesses. It's a one-pager business model canvas of a company which has all the possible levers which a person can change and imagine together and it is facilitated, whether it's your future value proposition, your key activities, who is gonna be your key partners, who are gonna be your key relationship partners there, what's revenue, what's cost, the person or the leader in the middle can actually tweak all of that with a, with a part of a group and facilitate this learning there. So you actually work on your business model, not even a different case study. You actually work on that and that's what companies work with us for, that help me run a workshop where we can use such tools to people to reimagine their own strategy first there. The other part is running a business. Remember we were, I was talking about entrepreneurship as a key skill for the model learner and for the modern businesses. Now how do you build entrepreneurship? Can you imagine the risk it has? It's easy to say, okay, give people opportunities, the 70, 20, 10, good, 70 is good, but how many of us will put our own money to say, run my business for one month, will you do it? Even if you like the guy. How easy it is to just straight away put that person to take decisions in real life, you know, which can affect lives which we are taking worth millions of dollars or hundred thousands of dollars of decisions. How about thinking of an online simulation tool where actually somebody can actually sit, this data can get customized and actually your potential future leaders can actually play it like a CEO, feel the heat which the CEO feels, feel the heat which a pilot feels. Okay, and that gives you a lot of change. You can make changes, you can actually increase your production, you can reduce your, let's say, marketing expense, you can increase, decrease your human power, see the a business acumen is functioned. What really it is to manage a PNL, rather than just having feedback five years in the company, manage a PNL there. Safe ground of working there, online uh, simulation. Uh, another example, second one, uh, which was talking more of capability part, is let's say offering safe learning environments. So for example, leadership, we speak a lot about leadership, how do we build leadership? Is there any fresh way to look at leadership? Not just to push it e-learning, that's not an approach, but can we make it a little more experiential on that one there? One way is that, okay, do a workshop, maybe do a bit of role plays, let people see it, do some outdoor activities, let two people do it, ten people watch it, go back home, clap, Feedback score five, leadership 360 feedback, not much difference, right? How about a simulation where, in this case, uh, it's called an iLead simulation where you can have a team of 10 individuals right there in front of you with their metrics in front. Just like in real life, they are sitting on different morals, they are sitting on different skill set, they have their own eccentricities. One is a multi-generational workforce, one is a new guy, he will keep taking holidays and he'll ask you for it. One is a distractor, one will ask for recognition, just like in real life. And you have all the possible decisions which you will otherwise take as a leader to play this one. Your goal is to get the business results by working on your people, by taking people-centric decisions using different leadership styles, different horses for different courses there. Real life play, 90 minutes, you get more than 90 role plays done. And of course, a huge amount of data in terms of your leadership style instantly on that one there. Another example of safe learning environments, just to open the paradigm of what are the possibilities for learning there. Uh, especially in this context, in the digital context there, we all are realizing now that authority is only taking you that much. 
one of the key skill sets to work which we realize with companies is ability to influence with minimal or sometimes even no authority. How do you ensure that if somebody is new in your company, if the person has the great idea and implementation prowess, he or she shouldn't wait for five years to become a manager to kind of get the whole momentum done, right? Uh, influence and change management. This is one of my favorites uh, which we work uh, with a lot of clients with there. It's called Change Quest. Essentially, it's a mandate of change which you have in a company and the simulation gives you very less authority, okay? And you have like about 10 to 15 stakeholders from CEO to board members to your peers, you know, who are partially have a bit of social networks built in which you have to discover. Some people like somebody, some people don't like somebody. All of this is back-end algorithm at the back for, uh, for you to respond. What you do is you change your decisions. You decide whether you want to partner with somebody, whether you want to get an external consultant, you want to make a presentation, you get some political view towards you, against you, understand the org dynamics of it. Now imagine how hard it is to actually teach this in a classroom otherwise. Okay, you'll probably rely more on your historic advice, on what you have seen there. You don't know exactly how the person will behave there. And you give him a big project of change, the person fails. Guess what? You haven't tried to understand the nosities of influence. Such a simulation comes out with an instant report on how a person approaches influence. Does it go one-on-one? -on -one? Do I believe in the power of social influence? Do I let these five people get convinced and then convince other people there. It tests your different approaches of influencing and change management. Again, about 60 to 90 minutes of a run play, but w imagine the learnings which you get there. I wish I had them uh, about 10 years back when I used to get these questions on, you know, how do we build this one there. So what is all, all careers and professions which are high stakes, whether it's your doctor, which operates you, whether it's the pilot which today takes you there. I know we had an example where human judgment works very well, which we will talk about as well, that how both can kind of lean in together, but still every pilot still has to go through certain hours of training before he actually or she is actually capable enough of it. Why do you think we do that? Because these are high stake careers. Then why my job or my company's position is no high stake? you're taking decisions on people, you probably can turn the fortunes either ways of your company. Don't you think that needs a pitch to play on before you actually either can judge somebody whether he or she is valid for it? Why would you take that much of a risk if there is an option there? Why would you just pay, base your decisions on likability? Why won't you say, okay, why don't you just run these businesses for like a couple of simulations, try to influence, I'll see how it goes there. Or why you can't use them as development tools to say, well, you want to become your manager, this is what business acumen, play it, play it again. And this is what simulation does. And that's one thing I love about simulations and gamification. Not the, not the glamour around it, but at the core, what they do beautifully is make failing fast very acceptable. And that's one problem I saw always with all the high potentials that, you know what, we don't get even this much leverage to fail. How will we want to learn? and that makes us always less confident. So we never raise our hand up. Everybody shuts down the idea, but this is like fail fast. So you play a simulation, you get a report, you practice it again, and then you apply it again there. No penalties. And businesses, business can afford it. It's just a license, you let the person flow. It's still far, far better than actually giving somebody reins of something and say, oh, let me drop you back there, right? So just like in cricket, somebody did ask me that, Gurpreet, why cannot I have a fair playing ground in my company? I wish before I got to this marketing leadership role, I would have got a bit of a fair play before. I said, well, no job comes with a fair play, right, on that one. I mean, they will say it, but they will expect results from day one there. But these are great examples where we see failing fast is okay. As we've seen so much, fail fast, fail often, fail forward. And that is possible for possibly only in a simulation kind of an environment. In real work, stakes become too high, to be honest, to make it more practical. How do you make 200 people take a reign of your company and then say, okay, let's see what happens. Uh, what is also important is given it's technological, one thing which is a natural outcome, uh, which can make a lot of decision making easier is data, right? So once you have immense amount of data points, more than 100 data points of a person, both behavioral, psychological, strategical, in the way he or she approaches uh, what will be a real life problem, you can actually sit with actionable insights, both the person, Instant. You don't wait for like five days and there's a 360 feedback which will tell me whether my leadership style has changed or not. Guess what? 90 minutes, you get a report and you get a debrief. You get a feedback there. 
right? From an organization perspective, 90 minutes you get a report to see all where your leaderships possibly are stacked on different competencies based on not people's perceptions, but their own actions, which they took there. So typically, how does a journey look like? So if, uh, if I take an example of a Nolscape consumer, on that. Is this only technology? Is this only simulations? Then what about the human element? Is, are the classrooms out of the picture? Uh, this is finally how it looks like there. So we call this omni-channel, which is essentially all clubbed together, you know, in a, in a curated formation. And curation is a big word here. So if you see that, let's say it has elements, we build it all together for client single platform on this, where you can have classroom sessions rocketing on simulations and reports there. You have a web and mobile platform which can have bytes on the learning. To just to keep the learning going, you can have quizzes to kind of capture each other, get more expertise on that. Action learning projects, ALP submission, sponsored by CXOs. That's how we believe the culture part gets addressed. If the project is not sponsored by the right people and it is not omni-channel to engage the modern learner, you will fail on one front, on that one there. So this is a typical journey which you would realize is neither classroom not simulations only, but actually a blend of everything together, all stitched on that. Uh, quick one there, this is a quick uh, uptake on how things are changing from an absorption to immersion as a, as a content part of it, from a leadership perspective. Now, if you see that here in the chart, there are two axes, absorption and immersion. The first two is what we've been used to seeing more, which is passive or active, uh, which is passively see a video or this. The critical part is immersion. Give immersion a chance on that. And there you can have two possibilities. Active immersion can be talking about a simulation, which I talked about. A passive immersion is, let's say, a virtual reality learning tour. We do this with companies for onboarding. What's the need of your Bangalore guy to come to Delhi office to see it? What about creating a virtual learning environment there? So immersion is the next game together to get the learning and capability up. And this is where I would like to summarize on what is in it for us. Uh, I think there is no better time, as I feel as an HR person is, uh, to really rethink the way what skills HR even needs. The good thing is you get the best product, but you don't really upskill the capability of your team. These are the three golden rules which over career I have kind of stood by in terms of evaluating either a vendor or a solution or even giving my team a bit of a view there. So one is meaningful, the other is usable, is it delightful? What we, must, what we might be thinking is meaning is the only thing? Definitely not. Today's user wanted to be usable, easy to follow, easy to search. As uh, uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar mentioned, Google doesn't give you the context, right? It, it is not usable at the way, at the time you like it there. Is it fun, experiential, memorable? Will I talk to my friends about it? Is it fun? Is it social? Can I challenge people around it? That kind of builds the experience. So uh, just a quick summary of uh, Nolscape, uh, how we make all of this happen together. We essentially work in three different spaces in talent transformation, assessment, using virtual assessments, uh, even neuro games there. Development, where we talk about journeys right now, which are uh, cumulative journeys, omni-channel journeys there. And finally, engagement. Uh, think of a quiz up where you can challenge each other, your people can challenge each other on values, culture, to your product knowledge, get expertise done all on your mobile there. Or onboarding, how do you engage somebody before and after using mobile and learning there? So the good news is we are outside, have a look at what might be some of the things which might figure out in your future. We have a team here to talk to you about this. And finally, these are the four key shifts I would say for us to possibly take back. That's what my experience says there. First, methodology, we are moving from absorption to immersion. Content is getting from commoditization to contextualization. Approach, journalized to hyper-personalized. And finally, engagement, more than standalone events to long-standing omni-channel leadership journeys there. So hit refresh is what the model learner tells us and also reminds me of uh, Satya Nadella who says, you will need new concepts for innovation there, but they need to be backed up with capability and culture. And trust me, your current systems which have been working would actually pull you down to get to the next leap. So you have to over amplify your investment actually even more than a natural way to actually push the change which is required there. And that's what is called a journey there. So cheers to your future initiatives. I hope uh, this quick one was useful. Happy to talk to you more, I guess. This time is not enough. Uh, to make sure that, you know, possibly your 
leadership interventions are uh, meaningful, your data and platforms are more usable, and your overall experience, remember, is worth playing again, again, and again. Thank you very much.